At first, I felt this way. It was really heartrending. It was really traumatizing. It was kind of cold. My first, I was just like, this can't be happening. I, 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 I was so frightened. My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Let me die the death of the righteous, and may my end be like theirs. Death, as old as time, and perhaps more certain than the air we breathe. Sometimes we see it coming, but sometimes it comes unexpectedly, leaving us gutted, aching, destroyed. And in its aftermath, grief-stricken, we wonder, how do we move on? Join us today as we talk about coping with grief. Then I remember going into bed and I started to scream and I said, Free, no, 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 I'm left alone. And of course, I'm bald out <laughs> and drunk on the ground and <laughs> rolled and, you know, just, just distraught. Boy, it was so agonizing. Um, it was it was overbearing for me. The reality really didn't hit me until maybe a year later or two later, and that is where. The sadness came in, the tears came in, the reality like, oh, she's gone. I literally broke down in the vehicle. So it's at that point I realized that, you know, this is something really happening. He's not here anymore. So. I said, no, not true. Wow, wow, emotions. <laughs> In a month, so probably years after, I was wondering why it happened to me. I made it upset, man. I made it really upset. I was angry, very angry. And um, I, you know, was saying to myself, God, why is this happening? I felt some bit of sadness, um, but mostly numbness. So I really didn't feel anything because it wasn't as surprising for me. In the moment itself, I was in denial. You know, so I pretend that they're still around, but I can't reach them right away. But over the years, I have kind of grown to accept it. I can't wrap my head around. I can't wrap my head around it because I keep wondering why she had to go when she did. Ah, uh, I have accepted. Um, how I deal with it, I get busy. Himself accepted his passing and, you know, gradually move on. Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm your host, Opal Morrison, and today I have with me a very special guest. We have Dr. Calvin Isaacs, who's a counseling psychologist. And he's also one of the elders right here at Elim Assembly. Dr. Isaacs, welcome. Thank you very much, Opa. Good to be here. So today it's all about grief. We're going to be talking about grief. And I think it's safe to say that we have all experienced some form of grief or know persons who have experienced grief. In fact, in Jamaica, the term grief has been used as a colloquial term. But I want you, Dr. Isaacs, to tell us exactly what is grief. Well, as you say, um, we all, especially in Jamaica here, we all encounter grief. And um, but grief is really a response, an emotional response to loss. That, that's, I guess, the broad, the basic definition of grief. It's an emotion. In some cases, it's very intense, depending on 
the nature of the loss, the kind of the loss, but it really is an intent, a, a response to loss. Okay, and when we talk about loss, what are we looking at? Well, the, the first thing we think about when we think about loss is death, right. the loss of a loved one. But um, a loss can be a loss of a relationship, can be a loss of a friendship, can be a loss of a job, it can be a loss of a pet. And sometimes, you know, we think of, yeah, but, but why would someone grieve if he loses a pet? Okay. But anything that is of value to you, if you lose it, you know, you can grieve over it. Mm -hmm. All right, so let us zoom in a little bit more on the grief as it relates to death. Mm -hmm. um, take us through that process in terms of the time of the loss to the time where we should be dealing or overcoming the grief. What are the stages involved in that process? Well, there are different theorists who have put forward, you know, um, theories that we go through in grieving over death. Well, the most common one is Kubler-Ross. And she has five stages. Um, anger is usually the first one. Denial, then there is bargaining, and there is depression, and there is acceptance. That's how she lays it out. But a person who is grieving does not necessarily go through that order. Okay. And sometimes you start at um, depression, you start at denial, and you, right, everybody grieves differently. But usually the final stage, when you really begin to come to grips with the loss, is acceptance. When you do accept that, yes, this is the situation. Okay. So you said that there is no particular order in terms of the stages. Right. Okay, but in terms of a time frame, how long should each stage be in terms of a time frame? How long should each term? It depends on the person. You know, we are we are all different. We grieve differently, and yes, some persons, you know, depending on your resilience, depending on the kind of relationship you had with the person, depending on the, you know, the value or the part that person played in your life, will determine, you know, how long you're at whatever stage. You know, some people stay at the denial stage for a long time. Others, it takes them a little while to get to it. So there is no standard. Okay. Yeah. Mm. And as you speak about the denial stage, how do we know the difference between managing grief and, you know, the red flag means that the person needs counseling? Um, managing grief. If you are managing grief, then you're really, um, you're coming to grips. It's like going through the stages. You're coming to grips with um, the fact that this person is no longer here, or this thing is no longer here, or this relationship or this situation no longer exists. So one, you are accepting it, which is one of the stage, again, you're accepting that. This is the situation, you're realizing that um, I don't have to adjust. Previously, I, would, I was able to depend on this person for this and for that and for that, but now he's no longer here. So when you get to the stage where you acknowledge that yes, I have to make some adjustments, then it shows that you're managing the grief well. If you're able to, if you're able to just grieve, some people grieve, well, people grieve differently. Some people cry, some people, um, they talk, some people just shut up, but whatever, when you get to the stage where you're naturally expressing, naturally dealing with grief the way you deal with it, that is one indication that you're managing it. Some of the indications that you're not managing it and you need help may be a case where there is withdrawal. Withdrawal, yes, is a kind of a, a response to it, but there are healthy responses and unhealthy responses. And a person who withdraws and shut down, initially that may be how the person deals with it. But if you, if you are withdrawn for a protracted period, there comes a time when, you know, um, it's going to be necessary for you to talk to somebody. So, so those are some of the things, you know. Um, so the person is withdrawn, the person is not doing the things that he should do. Some of the basic things. When we're dealing with grief, mm -hmm. ensure that you are, you eat. And sometimes we don't want to eat and the appetite is gone, but it is necessary that you maintain the basic bodily function. So even a little bit, we encourage them to, just a morsel, just eat something. 
just drink something. Make sure you stay hydrated. And one of the important things we encourage persons to do is to ensure, try to get some sleep. Because again, sometimes persons can't sleep. And if you, if you go without sleep for a protracted period, the effect on the body is going to be telling. Okay. Because I was going to ask you what are some of the implications in terms of not dealing with the grief properly. But I see some mm -hmm. of come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a friend, actually, his wife died about eight years ago. And every morning, he still makes a cup of tea that he puts at her seat at their table. And he sits and he has the tea with the cup of tea by her. So I suspect he would now be at a place where that's a red flag and he needs to get some cup mm -hmm. sleep. Because, I mean, he's eating, you know, yeah. but mm -hmm. he's still mm -hmm. not managing the grief as it relates to understanding that she's no longer there. Mm -hmm. So I guess he would be an example of somebody who needs to get a little more. Needs to get help. Right. You know, there is, the, the, there is this expression of complicated grief, which I won't get into, but um, complicated grief. One of the features of it is when over a protracted period, when normal, the, in most cases, most would have finished grieving. Um, he's still grieving or she's still grieving. Now, if somebody is grieving after six months, then you, you really can't say, you know, is this a red flag? Uh, does this person need more help than usual? But after eight years, definitely, <laughs> definitely, definitely needs help. And that person should be encouraged to, to, to seek counseling. Mm -hmm. okay. So Dr. Isaacs, talk to us about a support system, because I know a lot of times we have persons who are there for us during the time of grieving. So what should a support system look like for persons who are grieving? Well, maybe I can just flip and say a support system should, if somebody should just come and say, come, get up. It's time to <laughs> get up and go and do things. And, you know, we, we, we have a tendency to behave like that. We have a tendency to think that, okay, this is not good for this person, so we need to do whatever we can to get her to get him out of that situation. But the, the best way to go about support, well, I don't know if it's the best way, but one of the things we need to do is to, is to kind of come alongside the person. You know, so if the person is in denial, if the person is angry, try to come alongside and, and um, respond in that way. Right? We, one of the things you do is mirror. Now you have to be, you have to mirror what the person is putting out there, mirror the person's response. Now, if the person is angry, then you can't be angry either. But if the person is, is sad, is just, you know, sitting by himself, it wouldn't be appropriate for you to just come and say, no, man, you need to cheer up. Yeah. Cheer up, no. You come and just sit beside the person, not necessarily sad, but appreciating that the person is sad, appreciating that the person is quiet, and just talk to her quietly, and um, and you know move from there. A person, one of one of the support I, I mentioned a while ago that persons who are grieving sometimes neglect some of the important things they should do. One of the best ways we can do in terms of support is to ensure that these persons are doing these things. They are eating, they are drinking something, they are sleeping, and we just need to ask. You know, yes. are you doing this? And can I get something for you? Offer, offer to do practical things. Sometimes when, when, when persons are grieving and we go to support them, sometimes we don't even want to go because we say, what am I going to say? I don't know what to say. But the truth is that you really don't even have to say anything. Sometimes they just want you to be there. There's a biblical example of this. I guess the, 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 the most profound biblical example. When Job was suffering, his friends came and they sat with him for seven days and they didn't say a word and Job was comforted in those seven days. When Job started to get irritable was when they started to speak because they, they were thinking to themselves, you know, well, our friend is grieving. We really are not helping by just coming and just sitting down with him like that. We need to tell him something. We need to rouse him out of this slow. And so they started to talk. And the more they talk is the more irritable Job get because they were not really supporting him. Well, they were, they were trying to support, but they did not understand how to support him. They did not understand that he just needs a shoulder, an arm around the shoulder, a hug, somebody to be there, somebody to respond to you. And that's the thing. That's another way we can give support to. In just sitting with persons, you know, as I say, everybody is different. But sometimes you just need to go and just sit 
the person eventually may have some questions. And if you can answer those questions, it will it will help. So support is just is just making yourself available for the person to lean on okay. in whatever way the person wants to lean. The, the support is not you deciding for the person that this needs to be done and that needs to be done and it is time you move on. No, that is not good support. It's just being available. available. Mm -hmm. And I know that support comes from family and friends or can come from family and friends. Mm -hmm. And there are also external for, um, places that we can go to get support. We have intervention centers. Mm -hmm. Are you able to tell us about any of these places for persons who might be thinking that? Because sometimes we're not comfortable trusting other persons mm -hmm. in talking about how we're feeling. Mm -hmm. So for persons who feel more comfortable talking to others, where can we find some of these places? It would be good to talk to a professional counselor. You know, you know that person most likely is a, a good would be a good source of help. If you can't find a counselor, but you can find a pastor, right. you know, who will who can you know help you through. Um, in some cases, you may be able to get in touch with a social worker, or some of these hospitals have you know there's these counseling you know, section where there may be a chaplain or a social worker or a psychologist involved. So these are some of the places that, you know, we can go, you know, to get help. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, Dr. Isaacs, um, thank you so much for being here, for sharing with us. So if you want to reach out to somebody to talk, we have counselors right here at Healing Assembly, seven and a half short of rope, and the numbers are projected on the screen that you can call and just make contact with us. Thank you so much for joining us today on our program. Dr. Isaacs, thank you again so much for being here and You're talking to us about grief. You're most welcome. It was my pleasure.